I've spent a lot of my career studying the differences at the extremes between givers and takers. Givers being the people who enjoy helping others and often do it with no strings attached. Takers being people who are more selfish, all about me, who will volunteer for interesting, important, visible work, and then leave the grunt work for everyone else, but somehow walk away with the lion's share of credit for collective achievements, which is why you love working with takers, right? And I don't want to be too harsh on takers. Some of them are just narcissists, and they believe that you know, if I want to win, someone else has to lose, so they have very fragile egos. And if you live in a zero-sum world, you feel like you have to put yourself first. There's another group of takers who used to be givers, but got burned one too many times, and said it's just dangerous to be generous. And then there's a third group of takers um, that we won't be talking about today. Those are called psychopaths. <laughs> it's really important to understand who's a giver and who's a taker if you want people to be loyal to you, if you want people to have your back. And there is a personality trait that throws us off when we make these judgments. It's called agreeableness. Agreeable people are warm, friendly, polite, welcoming, nice people. Disagreeable people, more critical, skeptical, challenging, and far more likely to work as engineers, scientists, and financial analysts. Now, most people assume that agreeable people are givers and disagreeable people are takers. But in fact, there is no correspondence between those attributes. Because agreeableness, disagreeableness is your outer veneer, whereas giving and taking are your inner motives. And what you'll find is that the agreeable givers are easy to recognize, but they're not the best allies because they say yes to everything and they want to please everyone. They will often cheer at your idea when you meet with them face to face, but then they're afraid to rock the boat and they won't go to bat to support your idea. Disagreeable takers are also easy to recognize, although you may call them by a slightly different name. The other two combinations are the overlooked ones. There are disagreeable givers in our lives. I think these are the most undervalued sources of support for original ideas. They're gruff and tough on the surface, but underneath they have others' best interests at heart. And I had a programmer at Google who said, you know, oh, disagreeable giver. That's somebody with a bad user interface but a great operating system. These are the people who we need to support us because they are willing to give the critical feedback that we don't want to hear, but we desperately need to hear. These are the best advocates for ideas because when you bring a new idea to a disagreeable giver, you will find that that idea will get torn apart in the service of making it better. And then if you can convince that person, it's the best version of an enemy. Right? It's the, the person who cares enough about you to try to really challenge you. And then once they're on board with the idea, they will run through walls to support you. Now, for those of you who are highly disagreeable, one of the markers of that, this is actual evidence, is that you feel more joy when you're in an argument than when you're in a pleasant conversation. <laughs> and if you have one of those people in your lives, I would say embrace them, because those are the people who are going to make your idea better and then ultimately go to bat for it. The group you have to watch out for is the agreeable taker, also known as the faker. This is the person who is always friendly and smiles quite a bit, but then doesn't end up supporting you. Uh, my wife and I spent some time living in the UK a while back, uh, so this is especially interesting to me, how cross-cultural differences play out. When people ask where we lived, they're all excited. Did you live in London? No, we lived in Sheffield. Oh. <laughs> so the comparison between the US and the UK was fascinating to me because I found that there were far fewer agreeable takers here, that people were a little bit more upfront with their criticism, where I felt it was masked in the US. And there's some data to suggest that Americans feel extra pressure to be exuberant, to appear positive, even when they might hold a more critical, skeptical stance. But there is one country on Earth that's even further on the agreeable spectrum. Now, before I go further, do we have any Canadians? <laughs> OK, well, statistically, you're highly agreeable, so you will not be offended by what I'm about to say. <laughs> there was a radio station in Toronto years ago that said, we're going to have a national contest. We need more Canadian pride. So let's come up with a slogan that's the equivalent of as American as apple pie. So I'm thinking the winning entry is going to be as Canadian as maple syrup or as Canadian as ice hockey. But no, 4 million Canadians voted for the best demonstration of national agreeableness that you will ever find. I kid you not, the winning slogan was, as Canadian as possible, under the circumstances. <laughs> now, for those of you who are highly agreeable or slightly Canadian, you get this right away. How could I ever say I'm any one thing when I'm constantly adapting to try to please other people? And if that's you, it's well to remember that just because someone is nice to you does not mean that they actually care about you.
Now, there are some advantages of, a, of Canadian agreeableness. Sometimes the politeness will save you from danger. But overall, I think we all need to value the disagreeable givers in our lives more. And ultimately, as I've studied originals, one of the things I'm struck by is that they're not that different from the rest of us. That they don't always have wild and crazy ideas. That sometimes they're just people who are willing to bridge the gap from saying, I have an idea, to I'm going to be one of the 15% who's willing to speak up about it, instead of the 85% who stay silent. And that a lot of the challenge of being original is really just about mastering the sequel to creativity. Saying, look, it's important to be great at generating ideas, but it's just as critical to know how to communicate them and get other people to hear them. And I think if you can do a better job outlining some of the weaknesses of your ideas, along with the strengths, that there's some real quiet confidence in that. Right? To say, I believe in this idea enough that even if I admit its limitations, I still believe that its advantages are worth considering. Sometimes that means hiding your purpose and not telling people what your real end goal is so they will get on board with your initial ideas. Sometimes it means connecting your ideas to something more familiar. And sometimes it means looking to your enemies, looking to the most disagreeable people in your lives for insight and feedback. And if you do that well, I think we can increase the number of people who speak up about their ideas. And we can decrease the number of ideas that end up on the cutting room floor. So I would love to see a world with more originals, and I hope it's a world you will help me create.